We're right towards the end of a two-month series we've been preaching across the life of our church, which is based on the biblical principle of the Sabbath and Sabbath rest. And uh, it's something that Luke and I personally in our lives and leadership and family have been exploring for the past few years. And uh, last year, we actually also leaned on the principle of the Sabbath Year. So, yes, God commands the people of God, the community of faith, to take one day out of seven as rest uh, to worship and honour God, but also set up in the seasons and, you know, in, a, in the ground, in the earth, is this pattern which we see, and God also commands uh, the earliest people of God to take one year out of seven to rest also. And this was something that Luke and I had never done before. Uh, We, in fact, if you've listened to our sabbatical story podcast, you can go back and and listen to those eight episodes about why we took a sabbatical and how we planned it, how we structured it, what we were seeking to hear from God during that time. Uh, But as we were uh, planning for that, we realised we had planned in 2020 to take a bit of a quieter year. We started leading this church in 2013, but Luke's been in this church since he was a kid and I've been in this church since last century. I know. And we got married in 1999. Here's a fun thing. So uh, we we will celebrate 25 years of marriage at the end of the year. Silver and um, there's plenty of room left on my body for more silver. I'll take diamonds also. And um, And where was I? So in 2020, we were going to take this um, slower year because we'd had seven years of year-on-year growth in our church. So um, the number of people who'd been connecting with our church community had grown year-on-year, and that brings a lot of change. And so there'd been a lot of change year-on-year. You know, more people means new processes, new systems, new structures. It's a lot of change, teaching new people how to do new roles that didn't exist because before there were children, we didn't need a children's program, and then we did. Before there were youth, we didn't need a youth program, and then we did. You get the picture. And so in 2020, we had planned to take a bit of a restful year and lean a little bit on that principle without really fully understanding it and give our team a bit of a break as well. So we didn't pursue any aggressive growth goals as a church community that year, or that was our intention. And uh, we thought, let's just take it a little bit easy. Anywho, then uh, if anybody remembers back that far to 2020, it was a year unlike any other that's ever existed on the face of the earth. And uh, it ended up being one of the most stressful years Oh, no, it has, it, I think the most stressful year I've ever experienced in my life. And uh, so we did not end up having a very restful year, is the long story short. And so last year, after recovering from burnout and after trying to settle the ship here after a few years of chaos, we decided to lean on the principle of sabbatical rest. And so we took two months away from day-to-day activity and we're still so grateful and blessed by the many people who empowered us to do that from our board who govern our church right through to every team member who helped uh, step up in leadership and cover us to be away. And so while we were away, we, st- we kept going to church, but we went to a different church because when we're here, we lead and that's a very natural thing. And so we went to a church on the Central Coast, um, one of the Hope You See churches. So we're good friends with pastors Mark and Darlene Check, and they're the senior pastors of the Hope You See churches in Australia and some places around the world. And we were really intent that just because we were away from our church life and community and responsibilities, we definitely definitely wanted to be very present with the people of God in the community of God because we were so intent on hearing from God what his vision was for us personally, our family and our ministry over the next seven year period of productivity. That's what the reason for the rest was. And so one of those Sundays that we were down at Hope You See Charm Haven, uh, there was somebody there ministering who had a prophetic gift and she prayed for us. And she prayed this prophetic word of us where she kept saying, I believe God's given you this time so that you can rest to run. She said, that's all I keep getting, just rest to run. God's giving you this time so you can rest to run, rest to run. And we thought, well, that makes sense in the natural. 
because we are resting and uh, we like running. So we'll be keen to get back to running. Running hard has always been our pattern, hence the 2020 burnout for me. Uh, but we were being encouraged to rest well so that we could run again. Now, the weekly command to Sabbath gives us this opportunity every week. It's God's design that we work hard for six days each week and then are given the gift of a weekly day of rest to recharge, recuperate, reset, get our priorities right again, let God get back on the throne again if we've accidentally put ourselves on the throne in the ensuing week and then run again. Because as the people of God, we are definitely hard workers. So anything that we say about the Sabbath and weekly Sabbath rest, let me preface with, we as the people of God are hard workers. We are human beings and not human doings. So whenever our doing for God exceeds our being with God, we are in dangerous territory. However, having said that, the people of God are absolutely hard workers. It, it's one of the irrefutable, overarching messages and narratives of the entire Bible. God's people are great workers. We go above and beyond because we are representatives of heaven on earth. And not only do we do excellent work for our bosses or businesses in order to, order to store up resources for the future here on earth, but we also work hard on our spiritual lives and serving others in the community in order to store up treasure for our future home in heaven because we're always aware that earth is not our home as the people of God. Heaven is our home. Now, I found it so hard to limit the number of verses that advocate for the people of God being hard workers just down to a few, but here are a few to get us started. Proverbs 10.4, lazy people are soon poor. Hard workers get rich. Amen. I'll receive it. Proverbs 12.24, work hard and become a leader. Be lazy and become a slave. You get to choose. Proverbs 13 verse 4, lazy people want much but get little. But those who work hard will prosper. Amen. And in case you needed New Testament proof, Romans 12 verse 11, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. We as the people of God are not those people in the workplace that are always complaining and always trying to get by by doing less. We're the above and beyond people. They're the one, we're the ones that are there early and finish late because God gave us the gift of a whole day each week to rest and recharge and be reminded that God's holding us in the palm of his hand and everything's going to be okay in the end. As the people of God, we are hard workers. However, we don't work endlessly or without limits because also as the people of God, we create order. I've been trying to eliminate the word busy from my vocabulary because like many other people in our society and culture, I've used that word as a trophy. I've made it an idol and I've used that word busy to affirm my identity rather than finding my identity in being an image bearer of my loving creator. So I've instead adopted an ideology from somebody I admire who says I'm not busy I'm limited. And when somebody asks me to do something and I have to make a decision between yes and no, and when I have to consider that every yes I say is a no to something else, then I can give out those yeses and nos with great power and intentionality and authority because I'm not too busy, I'm just limited. I can't do everything. Just like you, I've got my limitations too. And they might be different, but we're all 
limited. And, uh, you know, God has been modelling creating order since the beginning because being limited means that you have to create order. It forces you to create order and it's something God's been modelling since the beginning. Separating light from dark, creating limits between night and day, land and sea. There's boundaries, right? People and animals, men and women, slavery and freedom, work and rest. He is a God who loves us enough to create order and limitations and boundaries. And so as we follow follow in his model, we are commanded to also follow his loving boundaries and limits because it keeps us healthy and allows us to live this earthly life to the full. So as the people of God, we create order. We get to choose where our yeses and nos will be. We get to create the limit in our lives of work and rest. We're not called to work endlessly. But that doesn't mean that living this way will be easy in a world which values different things to what we, the people of God, value. Which brings us to the crunch, which is that as the people of God, pure worship will cost us. As the people of God, pure worship will cost us. Creating the kind of order in our lives which allows us to take weekly Sabbath rest in order to run again costs something. And, you know, we see the law of sowing and reaping that God has ordained as part of both the natural and supernatural world. And what it means is that we only reap the reward of God's rest for us if we are prepared to sow the sacrifice of our time. Sowing and reaping, it applies across every area of our lives. Removing distractions from our lives one day per week to allow us to focus more closely on the voice of God will cost us. It's not easy. And God knows how difficult it is for us to remain faithfully devoted to him and his plan for a whole lifetime, which is why I believe that there is story after story after story in the Bible who have failed in the trying, because those failures are there to encourage us to get up and try again and recommit ourselves to faithfulness for the rest of our lifetime. Oh, even when it's hard to keep a pure heart of worship. I want to bring us around a story in the Bible that's really been speaking to me. And it's a story of um, King David who brings, in essence, a great plague upon the nation that he's leading because he chose to do something that God did not ask him to do. He lost his faithfulness for a moment. And the thing that he decided to do was he decided to count his troops He decided to count his troops, guys. Maybe there's a word here for somebody in our room who um, is tempted to count their time or their money. There's a danger in it because it puts our trust back on ourselves and removes our trust from God as being our provider. And, you know, I can't prove this until I talk to David and God about it one day in heaven myself. But I reckon that the lesson that God was trying to teach David was not to count his troops to to shore up his feelings of safety and security and self-worth and value and identity from himself, from the things that he had amassed, his wealth, his great strong people, his warriors, all of the armies that he'd put together. God was saying, no, David, this is a terrible thing you have done. You do not need to count your things because I am your provider. And so a plague comes across upon the people of Israel. And um, 
It's a really interesting story. The angel of death comes to visit David and, de- and it allows David to see his error. And so he knows he has to get his heart right with God again. And so he's prepared to be obedient to what God asks him to do. And we'll pick up the story there. We'll read this, the 2 Samuel version. It says, That day Gad came to David and said to him, Go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up to do what the Lord had commanded him. When Aruna saw the king and his men coming toward him, he came and bowed low before the king with his face to the ground. I mean, imagine if the king rocked up at your place. Why have you come, my lord the king? Aruna asked. David replied, I have come to buy your threshing floor and to build an altar to the Lord there so that he will stop the plague. And Aruna says, take it, my lord, the king, and use it as you wish. You know, we serve our kings. We serve our leaders. And he's got a good heart. He's trying to offer to serve his king by giving him what he needs to fulfill the offering. He says, here are oxen for the burnt offering and you can use the threshing boards and ox yokes for wood to build a fire on the altar. I will give it all to you, your majesty, and may the Lord your God accept your sacrifice. But the king replied to Aruna and said this, No, I insist on buying it, for I will not present burnt offerings to the Lord my God that have cost me nothing. I will not present burnt offerings to the Lord my God that have cost me nothing. So David paid him 50 pieces of silver for the threshing floor and the oxen. He built an altar there to the Lord, sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the Lord answered his prayer for the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. Oh, may we become a people of God so intent on pure hearts and faithful devotion that we would not bring an offering that costs us nothing. When we create order, limitations and separation between our work and our rest, it costs something, but it's a beautiful sacrifice to the Lord. When we take a full day each week to delight in God, experience His presence and allow Him to take His rightful place back on the throne of our hearts. It is costly worship, but it's a beautiful sacrifice to the Lord. You know, we've been talking a lot about how the principles around time and money are very similar in the Word of God and in the Kingdom of Heaven. And so similarly, when we bring our full tithe into the storehouse and hold nothing back, choosing to trust that God can do with 90% above and beyond what we could do with 100%, it's costly worship, but it's a beautiful sacrifice to the Lord. And if that means that we sit around the dinner table with our family and eat toasted sandwiches for dinner because that's all we can afford right now, choosing to adopt an attitude of feasting despite our circumstances. That is costly worship, but it's a beautiful sacrifice to the Lord. You know, initially when that period of our sabbatical extended rest finished last year, I thought that the next season of running would start straight away and I was ready for it because as you know I like to run and in a way it did but then as many of you know there's also been an extended season of waiting in our personal lives for a miracle from God and what I've learnt over this past year is that our willingness to rest has a direct correlation with our ability to take spiritual ground Because let me ask you these three questions. One, how do we have room for awareness of what God is doing and saying if we are overworked and busy? Two, 
How do we have time to say yes to what is important if our schedule is over full with what is urgent? Three, how do we have the strength to resist evil when we are tired? Here's Jesus' heart, desire, will for us as the people of God. He said this, There's a thief and his purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But my purpose is to give them, the people, us, the people of God, a rich and satisfying life. There is an enemy and he's a liar. He will try to steal your time. He will try to steal your focus and attention. He will speak lies to you that will distract you from who God says you are. That's not what Jesus wants for you and me today. His purpose is to give us a rich and satisfying life. And so what I know is this. Our sacrifice of rest, setting aside a day per week to Sabbath, together with the people of God, focus on what He's saying to us as individuals and as a community, is spiritual warfare. And I know I would not have had the strength, tenacity, courage, boldness and time to engage in that spiritual warfare if I had not received God's gift of rest before running into the next season. And so really my heart for us today is to have an opportunity to reset right now. And why don't you close your eyes and consider, is today your day to start creating order, to offer that costly sacrifice of praise and worship. Maybe it's not about your time for you. Maybe there's something else that the Holy Spirit is putting into your mind right now that God's asking you to lay down as a sacrifice and see what He will do with that free will offering. If that's something that you want to mark today, just just put your hand up. Do something physical that shows, yeah, I'm making a shift today. Something is changing in my life today. I'm creating order. I'm prepared to offer a costly sacrifice. I refuse to bring an offering that costs me nothing. Beautiful. Church, because we're the community of God, we're going to pray this blessing over each other. I'm just going to pray over you and you can echo the words in your heart. Lord God, we come before you and our desire is to bring worship that costs us something. We make room for you to clean out and and blow away the things that aren't of you. We speak the name of Jesus over our minds, over our families, our homes, this church, our community, our workplaces and our neighbourhoods. We declare that name Jesus has authority over every lie of the enemy that the victory is won. We are overcomers. We thank you for your gift of the Holy Spirit. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, you would fill each one of us afresh. We make room for awareness of you, of your voice to speak in our lives. We lay down everything that you've put in our hearts right now to lay down. We do it willingly and humbly, full of faith and trust that you're a good God and you're going to do good things. You work all things together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. We honour you. We praise you. We love you. We thank you, Jesus.